Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 43, Catherine, the Virgin Wife. Last week, we followed the early days of young Sophie Augusta Frederica, the soon-to-become Catherine as she heads toward her new country, Russia. Young Fiction has sent a final goodbye to her father, Christian Augustus. Off she went from the border town of Shvet, where she and her entourage, which included her mother Johanna, whose paper identified her as the Countess of Rhinebeck, traveled incognito. The trip started off uncomfortably, stopping each night at post houses to sleep in. As Johanna wrote, As the bedchambers were not heated, we had to take refuge in the postmaster's own room, which was little different from a pigsty. Husband, wife, Watchdog, chickens, and children all slept pell-mell in cradles, beds behind the stove on mattresses. This was not the type of trip that Johanna and her daughter were expecting from the onset. Slowly they made their way to Mittau, where they met Colonel Voyakov, who escorted them to Riga. There they were greeted by Prince Simeon Narishkin and Vice Governor Prince Dolgeruki. Things began to look up for the entourage as they were feted that evening, or as Johanna put it, When I go into dinner, the trumpets inside the house, and the drums, flutes, and hautboy of the guard outside sound a salute. I cannot believe that all this in honor of my poor self, for whom, in other places, they scarcely beat the drum, and elsewhere not even that. Notice how Sophie's mother thinks that all of this is about her, and nothing about her daughter. This was how Johanna viewed everything in life, all circling about her. She was in for, for a rude awakening. From here, they headed towards St. Petersburg, where, on the way, they passed an unusual group of black sledges, guarded by soldiers. Prince Narishkin told the inquisitive Johanna that they were owned by some other low-bearing duke who is of no consequence. The truth was, this depressing convoy contained the recently deposed Tsar Ivan VI and his mother Anna, who until recently had served as regent. How ironic that Ivan passed by the coach containing the person who, when Sophie became empress, would be killed on her orders. They arrived in St. Petersburg on February 3, 1744, at noon, where they were met at the steps of the Winter Palace, built by Peter the Great. This palace was not the one seen today. The present-day Winter Palace, originally designed by Rastrelli, was built during Elizabeth's reign. They were surrounded by handmaidens and servants who immediately took care of Johanna and Sophie. In a letter to her husband, Johanna wrote, When I reached my apartment, a thousand persons were presented to me. My tongue was dry and cold. I dine alone with the ladies and gentlemen whom Her Imperial Majesty has given me. I am served like a queen. They had little time to enjoy the royal treatment, as they needed to make it to Moscow no later than February 10th, as that was Grand Duke Peter's birthday. They began the arduous journey at night. What shocked the traveling pair was the vastness of the Russian plain. Russia was bigger and colder than anything they had ever experienced. They arrived in Moscow on February 9th. Once they made it to their apartments, they had little time to relax, as the Grand Duke arrived to escort them to meet Empress Elizabeth. Sophie was aghast at the sight of Peter. He was uglier, skinnier, and sicklier than she had remembered. Still, she knew she had to suck it up, as this was her ticket to greatness. Johanna, though, was walking on cloud nine, especially when she entered the audience chamber where Elizabeth came in. The most feared person in all of Russia was decked out in the finest French dress with diamonds scattered throughout her hair. Sophie bowed 
and kissed the empress's hand, who then walked around her, inspecting the young girl. The anti bestrushev faction was overjoyed when Elizabeth nodded in approval. Fiction was very marriageable, and would make the Grand Duke a fine and malleable wife, as the young girl was of a second-tier noble family, who would most assuredly know her place. Johanna was of a different mind, as she believed that her place was now in as an, an advisor to the Tsarina. She was again in for a rude awakening. But whatever she believed, one thing was for sure as she wrote to her husband, My daughter and I live like queens. Sophie and Johanna went from party to party, meeting with all the Russian nobles, ambassadors, and pretty much anyone who was anyone. The period of time was what you would call the honeymoon period for Sophie and Peter. They actually seemed to like each other and spent quality time together. But slowly differences began to creep in and break up the happy times. One issue was religion. Now, while both were born Lutherans, the Grand Duke had already converted to Orthodoxy, and Sophie was still learning about the religion she was about to adopt as her own. The problem was, while Sophie embraced her soon-to-be new religion, Peter detested it. Sophie also worked hard at learning Russian, which pleased Elizabeth to no end, while Peter lazily learned his adopted country's language. Peter grew jealous of Sophie and how her tutors constantly praised her devotion to her russification. She worked so hard that because of staying up late in a cold room with her lessons, she caught a cold, which eventually turned to pneumonia. In those days, few people survived this congestive lung disease. She was so close to death that a replacement bride was already in the works one princess of Darmstadt. Sophie was treated with the best medicine had to offer, bloodletting. Johanna begged that her daughter not be bled, but Elizabeth con insisted it continue. Her mother also wanted a Lutheran pastor to come to her daughter, but Sophie was quoted as saying, Why do that? Call Simeon Todorsky instead. I will gladly speak to him. She had chosen an orthodox priest, much to the delight of the empress and the people of Russia, as the news of this, this decision spread like wildfire. By her 15th birthday, on April 21, 1744, she was able to make a public appearance. She was gaunt and had lost a considerable amount of hair, but she was alive. Then in May of that year, everything almost unraveled. It seems that her mother Johanna had been plotting with Bestrushev's enemies to have him overthrown. But the sly vice-chancellor was wise to the plot and had Sophie's mother exposed, which caused the volatile Elizabeth to fly into a rage. Lestoc, the empress's physician, told Sophie, You can go pack your bags. You will be leaving for home immediately. The young girl's heart sank. Her mother's stupid need to be involved in court intrigues was to be her undoing, undoing her plans to one day become Empress of Russia. But Sophie was able to disarm Elizabeth, who understood that the mother and the daughter were separate and allowed them to stay. Sophie, for her part, took full advantage of the reprieve and redoubled her efforts to learn Russian and adopt the country's faith. As she said in her memoirs, my heart boded no good. I was sustained by ambition alone. There was something within me which never allowed me to doubt for a single moment that I should one day succeed in becoming the Empress of Russia in my own right. On June 28, 1744, Sophie was to be converted to Russian Orthodoxy with the following day to be the day to celebrate the engagement of the two children. Now, Sophie would have kept her name, as a, it was an acceptable Russian name, but Elizabeth strongly objected, as it was a reminder of her father's nemesis, his hated half-sister, Sophia. 
No, the child was to be Catherine in memory of the Empress's mother. She was to be baptized Catherine Alexeyevna. The next day, in a long ceremony where all involved had to stand for all four hours, the Grand Duke and the new Grand Duchess exchanged wedding rings. At the engagement dinner, Johanna demanded to sit with the young couple and the Empress. Elizabeth was furious at the lack of decorum and had Catherine's mother put in a separate room, divided by glass, alone, to dine without anyone to talk to. Johanna fumed and was ready to heap verbal abuse on her daughter the minute they were next alone. But that wasn't going to be easy, as due to her newfound place in the hierarchy of Russia, Johanna would have to be announced to see her own now royal child. Soon, the entire court of Elizabeth moved to the ancient holy city of Kiev. There, Catherine saw the discrepancy between the wealthy aristocracy and church as opposed to the absolutely wretched-looking general population. This was a stern early lesson for Catherine, one she never forgot. The relationship between Catherine and Peter was one of tolerance by the Duchess, as the Grand Duke acted quite childishly almost all the time, and with Peter acting quite indifferently towards Catherine. Then Peter came down with smallpox, which at the time was quite deadly. He survived, but his face was scarred, giving him an even uglier appearance than before. Catherine writes, all his features had grown coarser. His face was still all swollen, and one could see without a doubt that he would remain very marked. They had cut his hair, so he was wearing a huge wig that made him seem even more unsightly. He came toward me and asked if I did not have trouble recognizing him. I stammered out my congratulations on his convalescence. But indeed, he had become frightful. Elizabeth now had to choose a date for the wedding, as Peter was now fully recovered. The date selected was August 21st, 1745. Now, if anyone has ever been to a Russian Orthodox wedding, and I have, it is a long affair, as you know. It was an arduous task to endure, but Catherine made it through. The ball that followed was another ordeal the now exhausted Catherine survived. During the ball, Elizabeth abruptly ordered the two now married children, Catherine only 16 years of age, to the ceremonial bedchamber. With the ladies-in-waiting helping to get Catherine prepared to perform her duty, the young girl, taught nothing of what to expect, waited frightened in the bed. Hours passed, and no Peter. Finally, the Grand Duke made his appearance, drunk. He made it to the bed, but then he fell dead asleep. This was to become a consistent pattern of behavior for the many coming years. Later that year, Johanna was sent away, disgraced yet again by her continuing scheming against Bestrushev. Now, Catherine was truly alone in a new and scary country with an unloving husband and a now hostile mother-in-law. Elizabeth, who once fawned over the young children, grew increasingly cold, once accusing Catherine of continuing the intrigues of her mother and plotting to betray the Empress to Frederick of Prussia. Nothing could have been further from the truth, but Bestrushev had the Tsarina's ear and she believed everything he said. What Catherine was discovering about Elizabeth was what she came to realize about much of Russia. Peter the Great had only changed the veneer of Russian society towards the West. It was still dark and cruel deep inside, still harboring fears and customs influenced by its Mongol-controlled co past. A great deal more needed to be done to make the people more civilized in a Western style. As the Chevalier de Corberon was to write, 
It is as if there were two peoples, two different nations on the same soil. You're in the 14th century and the 18th century at the same time. But even the civilized part is only civilized on the surface. They are dressed up savages, people wearing beautiful cuffs and no shirt, green and rotten fruit that has been forced too soon. Form always takes precedence over substance. They like outward show and pay no heed to the essentials. Next week, we follow the maturation of Catherine and the abuse she had to endure before she took over control of the country. And now, for this week in Russian history, for the week of April 3rd through the 9th. In 1151, Igor Sviatoslavich, the Kievian Rus prince, is born. In 1242, during a battle on the ice of Lake Pepus, Russian forces, led by Alexander Nevsky, rebuff an invasion attempt by the Teutonic Knights. In 1866, Alexander II of Russia narrowly escapes an assassination attempt in the city of Kiev. The next year, in 1867, passing by a single vote, the United States Senate ratifies a treaty with Russia for the purchase of Alaska, known at the time as Seward's Folly. In 1917, Vladimir Lenin arrives in Russia from exile, marking the beginning of Bolshevik leadership and the Russian Revolution. In 1922, Joseph Stalin became the first general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. In 1942, during the siege of Leningrad, Soviet forces opened a much-needed railway link to Leningrad. And in 1951, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were sentenced to death in the United States for performing espionage for the Soviet Union. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't forget to visit the website at russianrulers.podhoster.com. Become a Facebook friend at Russian Rulers History Podcast and leave a message, make a suggestion, or ask a question. And as always, Das Vidanya Ispasiba Bolshoya.